Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back. I am glad to be back. Amongst a a lot of other things. (laughs) Uh, Hopefully, this new year, it's uh, actually when you take a look at what actually happened in the stock market, it's pretty amazing to see the the clients and see them uh, recover as quickly as they have. Um, Not all stocks have recovered, by the way. There are a lot of them that are still down. In a lot of sectors that are still below where they were last year, so might have a little gas left in it. And uh, I just thought this was interesting. This morning I was reading a market forecast. It's actually uh, it was a week ago. I take it back. It's from the Wall Street Journal, and the author is James McIntosh. Came up on December thirty twenty third, and he was talking about how the market forecast for twenty twenty one will be hard to predict. Now, he's saying that tongue-in-cheek because it's always hard to predict. (laughs) There's never a time when it hasn't been hard to predict. So, and what he's uh, uh, writing, I think, was was kind of funny. It's kind of like an inside joke. I I think there are probably a lot of newer investors that that may not realize that he was kind of poking fun. But uh, anyway, I just thought I'd read a a few of the uh, paragraphs here because I thought it was pretty interesting. And he says, we now know that if Wall Street analysts were publishing their 2020 forecasts, the virus that would upend them all was already spreading in Wuhan, China. Jonathan Golub was particularly unlucky. On January 21st, Mr. Golub, Credit Suisse's chief U.S. equity strategist, upgraded his prediction for the S&P 500 to end the year at 3,600. Now, see, that's cynicism at its best because it's exactly <laughs> where the uh, where the market ended up. What he was uh, anyway. I'm gonna. Continue, then I'll come back to that. Discounting the threat of COVID-19 that day was an easy to make a mistake to make, and one I made too. But imagine he had spotted the epidemiological consequences and correctly recognized that the economy would plunge into the deepest recession in centuries. Surely no one have con- would have concluded that his bullish S&P forecast was way too cautious, and the S&P would be more than 100 points higher than he expected by December. So... Uh, again, now when I first read this, I was going, what, you know, this doesn't make sense. And I was like, Oh, he's joking. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the point of this whole Mar- uh, article is that things are incredibly difficult to forecast for. They always have been, they always will be. And, uh, that's not really going to change all that much as long as there are humans involved as humans tend to be pretty unpredictable. They tend to respond in ways we don't expect them to. And when they do, you know, that's a surprise. In this case, the surprise with a big decline was followed by an even faster recovery that continued to surprise and continues to surprise people. Because the market's looking forward. It's looking at all the things that are going on in the economy, all the money that has been spent, the Increased savings rate, I've seen a couple different magazines uh, referring to the increased savings that our people are, are getting now. A lot of people have, you know, cut back on some, maybe some, a lot of other things they might have been doing because you can't really go to a movie. So they've been putting a lot of that money away. That increased savings is, finds its way into the stock market eventually. And actually, I'm sure some people up to their 401k plans, their contributions, trying to prepare as much as they can for retirement whenever that day comes. And uh, I just think it's it's pretty fascinating to have lived through this period. Kind of reminds me of, I don't know, you know, 1987 when uh, the S&P dropped 20% a day. That's when computers were first getting involved and they didn't really know a whole lot about how to stop an, uh, an avalanche. And a lot of that was basically computer driven. It wasn't, it didn't have a lot to do with valuations or the economy or anything else. And, uh, again, trying to predict those things is, is really difficult. 
So what's the answer? Because I get asked constantly, well, what do you think the market's going to do this year? And incidentally, that article, he goes back to make a forecast again <laughs> of, of where the market might be come the end of this year. And they're forecasting about 15, 10 to 15% higher than it is today. And that, that's a safe thing to do because you know, long-term average of stocks is right around 10% or so. So that's not being overly optimistic. It, it may be uh, it heavily dependent on how quickly the economy recovers, how many of these businesses get back to work and bring workers back into the economy. There are so many variables involved. It, it's just impossible to tell. And this is one of the reasons constantly we're talking about you know, putting, having a minimum of a 10-year time horizon. If you're investing, especially in stocks, and you're not willing to hang in there for at least 10 years, you know, you might want to think about other investments because investments are, you know, stocks are not that predictable. There are multiple 10-year time periods. You go back over the past 100 years or so, multiple 10-year time periods where the returns have been negative. And actually, I'll try to do some research on that week, on that, on that topic this week, and try to talk about it next year. I'll tell you exactly uh, how many times you've had a 10-year rolling time period where the returns in the stock market were negative. And so you have to kind of plan for that. And that, that's one of the things that we talk a lot about. When you get closer to retirement, you want to have, um, you want to have some things in place that you can invest in that aren't reliant on the stock market. Now that used to be government bonds or tax-free bonds, CDs. Those are paying so little today that it's one of the reasons that I've been talking so much about uh, the various types of annuities that are out there because they have a higher payout rate. Now they're, they're more competitive. They're competitive today. And I had a client ask me who uh, knew for a long time that I hadn't used annuities for a, a long time. I mean, it, there was a time period where you could get a variable annuity. That's basically tax deferred mutual funds and, you know, it works kind of like a non-deductible IRA kind of, uh, you put money in there and you were able to manage it. You wouldn't, it would be all tax deferred. You could make changes. We used to use some momentum models in there and, uh, wouldn't get a 1099 at the end of the year. We we're able to actively manage those things. And it was a, it was a really good deal at that time. The, Internal expenses on those products went up quite a bit, and I just stopped using them for an extremely long time period. So, and I probably, if if CD rates were back to five or six percent, and good luck getting that again, and uh, I don't know that that'll happen in my lifetime. And uh, you know, I probably have a thirty-five uh, year life expectancy. <laughs> so. I, I, I don't know that the interest rates will ever get back to 5 or 6% in that time period. Why? Well, because of all the debt that we have. And when you raise interest rates, you know, the government's got to pay more on all that debt. And that would make it probably the second largest item on the federal budget, interest expense. I'm not sure anybody has the guts to do that. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm wrong. But that big screeching, you know... <laughs> screeching sound that you'd all be hearing. That would be the economy, economy slowing down because they raised interest rates and had to raise taxes to pay for it. So we're in a kind of a strange spot. And anyway, that's why we're talking about these other, these alternatives. And having said that, you should see how quickly new products are being launched. It, it's a nightmare to keep up with, by the way. Because I don't like to talk about much unless I feel like I know it very, very well. And every, uh, I don't know, probably every month over the past three or four years, there's been somebody coming out with something new with a little bit of a twist here and there. And uh, I, I just can't remember seeing as many innovations, as many uh, alterations happening in such a short time period. It's exhausting <laughs> to try to keep up with all that. It's just exhausting. So, um, but, you know, having said that, there's a, uh, an, another new product that I was looking at. I'm watching this stuff all the time and it looks really good. I've, I've not seen this before. This is the, uh, the first time it's ever come across my desk. So this is actually, uh, an in investment only annuity. The expenses are very low because there's not much insurance. 
In fact, you can add insurance to it and they tell you how much it's going to cost. And for this one, uh, it's 0.45% to add a, uh, a rider on here that's going to guarantee an income and an, and an account value. And instead of boring everybody to death with all this stuff, I'm just going to tell you it's pretty good. It's actually very good. Particularly if you're in your 40s or 50s and you don't, you'd like to invest in stocks. In this one, you can invest 100% in stocks. And uh, you don't want to have to worry that the stock market goes down right when you get ready to retire and cuts the amount of income that you might be taking out of it by, by half because it'll guarantee a certain amount of income. Depends on your uh, age and if you're going to go joint. Again, these are not as high as the ones I've been talking about. The lifetime withdrawal percentage is 4% for an individual, 3.75 for a couple. But when you compare that to current interest rates, it's pretty good. And uh, this one in particular allows you to invest up to a, up to 100% into the stock funds. That's brand new. That's unusual that they would do that. So you could have a, uh, it, it's pretty good. I, I really like it. If you'd like to know more about that, uh, this is another nationwide product, by the way, and they call it Nationwide Pro for Income uh, Writer. There's a, uh, they have an advisory retirement income annuity. That it's a, uh, a new division. It was started, I don't know, probably just a couple of years ago, actually. They, they bought a company that I used to use, and uh, they've added to it. So very, very uh, interesting. It's actually probably too much to go over on a, uh, on a radio program like this. But I'll just tell you, they, you know, they're, they've got funds from Fidelity, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, you know, and an, an amazing array of funds. They have uh, institutional pricing on them. That's great. And uh, there's no sales charge in or out. And basically, you're, you and your advisor get to work out what they want to charge to manage it. And the in income guarantees are net of all the fees and expenses. So if you'd like to know more about that one, that's not the same one I've been talking about. The one I've been talking about has a higher payout percentage. It does. It has a higher payout percentage. And its expenses are higher because you have to pay for the insurance. So if they're going to guarantee higher amounts, it's going to be higher. And the expenses will be a little bit higher on that. So anyway, I feel like I'm boring myself. <laughs> and uh, this is the, uh, but it is, a, it's a really interesting product. I mean, I, they, I get a ton of stuff from a lot of these companies and it's amazing how things change over time. It used to be that uh, if, if an annuity was owned by a trust, that that was a really bad thing uh, because it would actually at one point in time, I believe going back a really long time ago, that the annuity would lose its tax deferred status. Now, don't quote me on that because that was a long time ago. But I seem to remember that if you named a trust as the owner of annuity, then the trust that the annuity lost its tax deferred status. So that's not true today. You can have irrevocable trusts and some other types of trusts that actually own an annuity and maintain the tax deferred status. Why is that important? Well, because a lot of trusts have really high taxes once you get past uh, a few thousand dollars. I think it's twelve or fifteen thousand dollars a year in income. I'll have to look up the number. But once you get over that, in a uh, in a trust, the trust has gets taxed. The income in the trust gets taxed, and it's at a very high rate, and it doesn't allow for a lot of of growth. So putting dividend type paying stocks in something like that could be pretty bad uh, from a tax standpoint. And now it looks like there's a uh, partial solution to that problem that looks pretty good. So, and I have to tell you right now, um, whatever I've said here, do not take that as legal or investment advice or tax advice because we have to say that. <laughs> Actually, we do. The, uh, you just you want to talk to your tax advisor, you want to talk to the legal advisor, or, or you could give me a call if you have questions about it. <clears throat> but there are some really interesting things that you can do now that you couldn't do before. 
And to be able to take advantage of this, these kinds of things, it, it might be worth your while. I think it's probably definitely worth your while. But uh, it's not like I'm bored, by the way. This is our busiest time of year. And, of course, the, uh, I would get sick during that time period. <laughs> you can probably hear it in my voice. Yeah. Um, but that being said, we love our jobs. We love working with people. Uh, it is really fascinating uh, to, to see all the changes that are coming about year after year after year. And they're not slowing down. They're actually speeding up. So that is mind-boggling. It is absolutely mind-boggling. One of the things, actually, this has been around for a few years that, that really uh, um, fascinates me a little bit. And I just got to uh, mention that I'm only going to have about one minute left. So I think I'll save this until after the commercial break. But, um, yeah, it's a way of, of lowering your taxes a little bit. And I know everybody's ears kind of perk up when you hear that. Yeah, so we'll get uh, back from this next commercial break. We will actually start to go into that and how that works a little bit. And I'll tell you, uh, one thing, well, a couple of things you can count on, I think, over your lifetime. People used to say death and taxes. I'm going to add to that is change. I hear the music. That means I got to go for a minute or two. This is Bill Bullington right here on 1420. Stay tuned because I'll be right back. Listen to Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon on 1420. You can find a copy of this radio program if you want to listen to it again. You heard something that you wanted more information on. You can go to my website. It's bullingtoncapital.com. You can also find it, I think, on the Fish's website, 955thefish.com, under the podcast section. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And it's amazing uh, technology we have today. And I was just, uh, I thought I would take a little bit of time Oh, there was another article from Forbes, and uh, one of the author was Juan Carlos uh, Medina. I'm not sure if they pronounce it Medina, Medina, but uh, anyway, he wrote this article, and it was how to reach retirement freedom in just 10 minutes. And I'm, I was reading the article, and it's pretty good, uh, very good actually. And uh, I just would have loved to have talked with this guy because I'm writing a little booklet. I was going to call it a book. But you know what? It's just not that complicated. <laughs> you have all these retirement planning tools online. They're relatively simple to use if you've been doing this for a while. And if you haven't been doing it for a while, they're still kind of easy to use. But the, um, it, it might take you a little bit to play around with it. But there's some really basic things, I think, that, that people have a tendency not to know about because they really don't talk a whole lot about these things uh, in the... Uh, in depth, and I'm I'm pretty sure it's because they find they think it it'll bore everybody to tears, and they won't read all the articles. But you know, you give courses on it, and then and give grades and charge people tuition, and then they study. <laughs> but uh, when it just comes to ourselves, you know, I get it. it it's a uh, it's a lot. It, it can be a lot. But reality is, uh, I've got some software that we've got from actually multiple sources. I have different types of software that you can put in what you're doing today and it'll show you approximately where you're going to be based on how you're investing uh, if you're investing and it doesn't match what kind of risks you want to take and you can adjust that we do these for anybody that asks for them um, it's not my style to try to force something on anybody but if you want to do this if you're a client you didn't realize that, that we did this for almost all of our clients then give me a call uh, it doesn't take all that long of a time period. The calculations are relatively simple and the numbers are, are relatively simple because here's, here's retirement planning 101 in a nutshell. Take 
whatever income you want, divide it by 4%. That's the 4% rule. In other words, if you wanted $40,000, $40,000 equals 40%, or I'm sorry, equals 4% of a million bucks. So you'd need a million dollars to generate $40,000 in retirement income if you were going to take out 4% a year. Now remember, on the current interest rate, CDs are only paying 1%. Okay, so if you're going to be taking out 4%, you're either going to be spending principal, counting on the fact that you're going to pass away before you run out of money, or you're going to have to invest in stocks, bonds, cash, we call those balanced accounts. The actual dollar amount or the percentages that you have in each one of those categories is going to depend on how much uh, tolerance for risk you have. And I am absolutely amazed how different people are in their tolerances for risk. It just blows my mind. And a lot of them are married couples, by the way. That's, a, uh, that's kind of interesting when a married couple's never had to talk about this before. And then you bring it up and they say, yeah, well, the you know, stock market's great. It's average 10% a year going back to the 1920s, right? Well, it's close. Okay. Uh, the, the only problem is what we were talking about a little bit earlier in today's show is that the stock market drops a lot occasionally. And sometimes it takes a long time to make it all up. So if you're planning on pulling money out and it's down by 50%, you could be pulling out so much money that you end up running out of money in retirement. And that's no fun. And I'm sure everybody's uh, wanting to avoid that, <laughs> if at all humanly possible. And so what do you do? Uh, well, that's why you have a diversified portfolio. You're going to have some stocks in there, more than likely. You're going to have some shorter-term bond funds, more than likely. Um, you're also going to probably start looking at annuities, if you haven't already, because annuities are uh, very competitive in today's environment. Again, if I see interest rates go back to 5 or 6%, I won't need annuities. Neither will you. Okay, You can, uh, but until that happens, and who knows, that... That may not happen for, you know, I think uh, the President Powell, President of the Fed said, I call him President Powell because uh, he's got more power than the real president does. He controls the biggest economy in the world. <laughs> he's the man. <laughs> so he said interest rates are going to stay this low for the foreseeable future. And he paused. I'm going, uh-oh. <laughs> that means they're not... They're not Probably not raising interest rates anytime real soon, which is great for real estate. I mean, it's awesome. It's horrible for retirees looking to generate a decent income from their investments without having to go into stocks. You know, actually, the, there are a bunch of funds out there. I use several of them in the models that we run that have dividend yields that are higher than CD rates, higher than 10-year treasuries. And they're from stocks. Now, those dividend yields are going to fluctuate, and so will the holdings, because they don't just buy them and hold them, they buy them and manage them. Some stocks are going to come in, some stocks are going to go out. It really depends on how that fund is being managed to determine what that's going to be. And when we went into commercial break, where I was talking about the tax efficiency of a lot of these things. Yeah, they, these guys have gotten the rules to the point where when they follow certain guidelines, even though they're turning the portfolio over, meaning buying and selling stocks, adjusting their positions. They're not actually distributing capital gains on that. That's pretty cool. So you can avoid an unexpected capital gain. I know people love capital gains, especially when they didn't expect to get one. And all of a sudden you get a 1099 and you have to pay big taxes on it. Well, it's less likely that that's going to happen if you're using the right types of funds. And uh, that's where the investment only, now listen to this, guys, investment only. Yes, I'm talking to you like your parents did when you were little, because there are so many different types of annuities out there that uh, when people say, I hate all annuities, I'm not a big fan of a lot of annuities that believe me, but the investment only type doesn't charge a sales charge going in. It doesn't charge a sales charge going out. There are no limits Theoretically, anyway, the insurance company could uh, limit the amount that you can put into one. But you can put in 
millions of dollars in these things, and they're all tax deferred until you start to take the money out. But you have complete control over the taxes because you have complete control over when you take the money out. Now, that could be a problem if you had to take money out that you didn't have, expect to have to take out. But all other things being equal, it's pretty good. When you start to look around at some of the funds that are available inside of some of those products now, and this is relatively new. Now, I don't know, over the past, I don't know, five years, um, maybe 10, the, uh, which is relatively new because stocks have been around since before this country was even a country. No, that's another whole story. I'll have to do that on a different show. <laughs> but yeah, did you know that stocks are older than America is? Like by far? And uh, especially in, um, whatchamacallit, oh, Middle Eastern countries, it, uh, oh, my mind is going on me. <laughs> but st stock investing in uh, partnerships are much, much, much older than charging interest. There are a lot of societies when they first started doing banking, uh, they, a lot of them were called merchants back then. And uh, there were societies that made charging someone interest illegal. They weren't allowed to do that. So if you wanted to invest, you had to be a partner. You bought shares and they would go out, fund the ship. The ship would go out, go to China, bring the silk back, sell it, and then split up all the profits amongst all the investors, all the partners. So stocks are a lot. Of, by the way, the, uh, what is it, uh, the Plymouth Rock in America where the pilgrims first came and, you know, named it, it's going to be Plymouth Rock. The reason that they did that was because the Plymouth Land Company in England a stock ownership company had financed the journey. Think about that. And then they come over. That, those guys were really smart, buying all that land up from the Indians for a few trinkets. <laughs> I wonder what the dividends on that were. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was kind of funny. You know, it's really funny. You look down through history. France came to the United States, and they were France had watched the Spaniards, you know, go down South America, bring back all the gold build up the Spanish Armada. And then they see uh, England coming to the United States, tons and tons of timber. Uh, they, there were lots of s ships that actually sank because they loaded them down so heavily with, with timber uh, to bring back to Europe. Um, but that was, a, that was a boom for European merchants back in the day. So France thinks for sure, you know, this, hey, we're going to go get the middle third of that United States. We're going to call it the Mississippi Territory. It was... Mississippi used to be the entire third of the United States when it was owned by France. They get here, they get down to Louisiana, they start making their way north, and all they find are a bunch of beavers. <laughs> it's swampland. <laughs> and the Mississippi Land Company had to file for bankruptcy. <laughs> they had sold stock, and they couldn't pay their dividends. <laughs> So everybody thinks that modern finance is really modern. This is all new. No, <laughs> it's really old. I mean, really old. So uh, <laughs> might be new to you, uh, but we've been selling bonds and stocks and participation and all these things. And actually, uh, who was it? Um, oh, Isaac Newton. Yeah, he was a uh, professor. And, you know, the whole gravity thing in Cambridge. And he lost all of his money speculating on Dutch tulip bulbs. <laughs> so this guy who figures out what the speed of light is before we had a computer. I mean, he was using mirrors. <laughs> He'd uh, figured out what gravity was. This guy's like a genius. You know, take Elon Musk and multiply him by about 10 for the time period that he was running. And he lost all of his money <laughs> betting. And, and by the way, he would have, he would have starved if he hadn't had a pension from Cambridge. So, it, but he had a, uh, it was so funny. His comment over that was, I can calculate the movement of heavenly bodies. He was one that figured out also well, gets credit for figuring out that the earth went around the sun, not the other way around and figuring out what the uh, speed of light was. He said he could calculate the movement of heavenly bodies, but he couldn't calculate the madness of men. And he laughed. <laughs> At least that's what I read. So I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there's a really good old book. 
incidentally, you want to go to see how old speculation is. Uh, popular delusions and madness of crowds. I, I forget when it was written. It was in the 1700s or maybe the late 1600s where they talked about a lot of these things. And uh, it was pretty funny. So not much has really changed in the financial world. Uh, you get a company that wants to go into business. In fact, I had a, a client send me an email. Can you look into this company for me? And I looked it up. And this company is going public. They're raising money to go out and buy other companies. So they really don't have a company yet. <laughs> They're raising money to go out and buy other companies. Now that may work out really well. It depends on, you know, who's managing it, how well they pick these other companies. Uh, kind of similar to what Warren Buffett did with Berkshire Hathaway. Warren Buffett bought up the controlling interest in Berkshire Hathaway. He shut down his partnerships and then Berkshire Hathaway became a holding company that he used to acquire all those other businesses. How cool is that? So it's an it's an kind of an old concept, but they're, they're raising money from scratch to be able to try to do this. I know that this stuff is probably uh, just fascinating people to death, <laughs> but I get off on a tangent fairly fairly frequently. And, uh, and I was just talking about you know oh it's, it's one porter, portion of risk, a part of risk that doesn't get talked about too often. And it's getting talked about much more frequently now. I think probably because that the 60 and over population is the fastest growing segment of the population. And they know that, you know, we're getting close to retirement. We don't have 10 or 15 years to sit on our investments to get our money back. We need to, we can't do that. We'll run out of money. And that's called the uh, sequence of events. So if you, you know corrections are coming, but you can't predict exactly when, so you have to be on, on guard against that sort of thing. That's one of the reasons that you do have fixed income in your portfolio. Fixed income today being so low, one of your better options, uh, I think for an awful lot of people, not everybody, but for an awful lot of people, a good option for fixed income are the fixed indexed annuities. Those are very specific. Uh, not all of them. Some of them, the expenses are just too high. But uh, I think if you take a look at that, You've got uh, income-oriented annuities out there. Um, some of them, they're, they're a bunch of different types, but I, I think taking a look at that is, a, is really going to be a big help to an awful lot of people. And uh, if you want more information on that, you know, feel free to go to my website. There's a, a contact us form there. You can fill that out. Please write the question in. When somebody, Paul, you know, we get a ton of people that, are, that will contact us through there, but they don't put what their question is. So I, I really don't know. And it takes me a lot of time to actually re return reply, uh, my replies to those. So it would really be helpful if you would talk to me about what it was that you had the question about. And uh, that would be e extremely helpful, actually, because I have to answer the, uh, the emails anyway. And if, if you've got one and it, you, you submitted a question and it didn't get answered, uh, it's probably because I only get a couple hundred a week in... Uh, I may have it may have gone into my spam folder, so I don't know. So if, if that's happened, please just reach out again or, or give us a call. 330-664-0700. Now they hear music. I gotta take another quick commercial break. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420. back 
That's really a nice song. I like that a lot. So anyway, I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, most of what I talk about, actually, it's the same thing. It's called managing risk. That's what you're really doing. Good portfolio management, if you take care of the risk, portfolios normally take care of themselves pretty well. And how do you do that? I have this super simple method of determining how much money you should have in stocks versus bonds. Okay, it's super simple. And it's based on your personality. It's not based on these, you know, you ever see those questionnaires they come on? I know you have. Yeah, you, uh, you can't figure out how to answer the questions and you, they, they all seem like trick questions and then they come out with this report and uh, <laughs> it, it just drives me nuts. It, remember, it reminds me of when I was new in the industry. I remember reading about uh, a book Peter Lynch had written, I think it's 1988. You know, I'd only been in the business for a couple of years. The, uh, he said that the average stock on the New York Stock Exchange annual range from top to bottom was 50%. And I was like, what? <laughs> you could get cut in half. <laughs> and I had no idea. So I go running up to my branch manager at the time and I go, hey, is this true? He looks at it. He goes, oh, no, 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 that'll never happen. He, he didn't want me to, he didn't want me to know. <laughs> he didn't think I could sell anything if I did that. And uh, it's not avoiding it. And that's what the average investor thinks they're going to do. They think they're going to avoid that sort of thing. It's not going to happen. And let me ask you a question. Do you think stocks are less volatile today than they were then? Really? <laughs> no, they're actually a little bit more volatile than they were. So the average stock, if you're down 50% on a stock, that's normal. 50% is normal. Okay. It's not fun, but it is normal. And whole portfolios have been down more than 50% more than once. In my, my career, you see it all the time. And that's not abnormal. So here's the deal. If you don't want to see your stocks down by 50% or more, don't put all of your money in stocks. It's that simple. If you don't want to see your portfolio get cut in half, don't put all of your money in stocks. Uh, I'll give you a little rule of thumb I like to use. So I've seen the market down over 50% a little bit, twice in my career, and I've seen it down over 25 or over 30% multiple times, especially during my lifetime. Actually, I wasn't licensed back in the 1970s, but anyway, so you got to figure 50% is probably a fairly decent number. It doesn't happen that often, but occasionally it happens. So if you were down by 50%, how would you feel? And how would that make you feel? It'd make me nervous, that's for sure. I'd be taking out a home equity loan and putting it in the stock market, <laughs> knowing what I know about stocks. But the, uh, um, hey, you know what? Next time that happens, I pro probably will do that. The, uh, anyway, hopefully it doesn't happen. <laughs> but that's, that's the rule of thumb. So take whatever decline that you think you could put up with. So let's say, you go, well, I think I'm pretty conservative, but I know I need to make some money. I'm not going to make it at 1%. And it's, or less than 1% in a CD, 10-year government bond paying less than 1%, that's going to be hard to make money. So I'm willing to see some fluctuation if I think over time that I'll get paid. Over time, it'll be worthwhile. Great. Well, how much fluctuation can you put up with? Uh, 25%. Great. Take 25%, multiply it by two. Don't go more than 50% in stocks. Think about that for a second. If I were 50% in stocks and they got cut in half, my whole portfolio would only be down 25%. Voila. And I really need to, uh, now that I've, I, I know I've talked about this multiple times throughout my career, actually. And I talked about it just because I, I really am not happy with the risk tolerance questionnaires. Nobody understands those things. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I take them all the time. And I'm still taking them. Somebody, occasionally somebody will come out with a new one. I'll look at it and go, yeah, nobody's going to understand that either. <laughs> and they don't. And they're basically, they're investing on blind faith. Oh, it sounded good when the guy was explaining it. Or female. And uh, so I just decided that I would follow. By the way, Warren Buffett also, I read that he had said that. If you can't stand to see the value of your stocks drop by 50% or more, don't buy stocks. I thought he was, I thought those guys were kidding. 
And a large part of the reason was I was really young and my managers were going, oh yeah, yeah, those guys, they're, 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 that'll never happen. <laughs> really? <laughs> so having lived through that more than once. And by the way, I'm kind of the, uh, a little bit of a doubting Thomas. I spent my own money on computers. Computers back in those days were really expensive. The software, incredibly expensive. But I wanted to know. So I got this software from a company that was called High Sales. I think, I, I can't remember who owns them now. Um, they're still around somewhere. But anyway, you could run these things called hypothetical illustrations. That's like if I put my money in this fund that was around back then, if it were around back then, what would the annual fluctuation be? What would the account values have been? What would have been the, re the returns? And that cost me a lot of money, but I just wanted to know. And that's when I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch, they weren't kidding. <laughs> the volatility of stocks is incredibly high. That's one of the reasons that you, you have to look around for other things, particularly when you get within 10 years of retirement. You do not want your investments 100% in stock when you get within 10 years of retirement. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe if, if you've got $10 million and you can live on you know, 100,000 bucks a year, uh, that'd be about 1%. Well, yeah, okay, you could probably be 100% in stock, no problem. Actually, you, you could probably go up to 200,000 and still not have too big of a problem. Now, you wouldn't feel really good if you saw your $10 million account down to 5 million bucks. That would not feel good, <laughs> but you wouldn't run out of money as long as you weren't spending more than 2% or so. And well, you shouldn't run out of money. Anyway, you can never say never, but I hope this makes sense because it's been, I've been talking about this for years and years and years. And, and I, I have the morning star questionnaire and you know, I'm looking at it and I'm not sure how to, how to answer the questions myself. <laughs> I've had this thing forever and, uh, and then they come out with this really nice recommendation and you know, it's based on a whole bunch of really fancy research and nobody knows what it means. So it's, it's not all that helpful. And I think the, the real reason that that kind of stuff actually even works is because everybody's doing the same thing. And when somebody says, well, how much are you down? And they find out that their neighbor's down as much as they are they're like, Oh, <laughs> Well, I guess it must, I must, it must not just be me. And occasionally it can just be you, but those are really tough times, by the way. Yeah. And if you go about picking individual stocks, you'll, you'll get, you probably know what that experience is like already. So anyway, that's the, the Bullington Capital Risk Tolerance Questionnaire. Figure out how much of a decline that you think you can put up with and not panic. That's the key. It's not panicking. I was looking at another one of those uh, articles from 1999 to 2018. The average investor made 1.9%. That's what the average investor made. You know why? Because the average investor runs for the hills when things get at sooner or later. We called it puking <laughs> a long time ago. The, uh, they puke at the lows. They sell when they're down a lot. And you never get people selling when they're up a lot or not often. Anyway, so that's, you know, it's, this is 95% mental. It's 95% between your ears. Now you can look into, I was looking into the um, prospectus of a fund. That's a nice fund. It's got a good track record. When I look at it, I go, wow, that, that was really curve fit, but it was curve fit in a really smart sort of way. So the chances when something is curve fit, and I don't have time to explain that today, by the way, but the, um, maybe I'll use that for next week's show. The, uh, when something is, is curve fit, it's probably not going to work as well in the test. Uh, I'm sorry, in the real world as it did in the test. That happens all the time. Doesn't mean that there's no value to it. It just, it may be a little misleading. And it, it's an honest, easy mistake for anybody to make, even somebody who's got advanced degrees in math. So uh, you just have to be really careful about that. But there are some really good funds out there. I think I've got a bunch of them in my portfolios. They don't work like people want them to because everybody wants things that go straight up and they tell you before they're going to start heading down and that ain't ever going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, and they don't move all up. They don't move at the same time. That would defeat the whole purpose of diversification. If they all move together in the same direction at the same time and speed, how does that help you? By holding more funds. It wouldn't. It would be dumb. 
And uh, so anyway, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll quit preaching now. And uh, I think I only have a few more minutes before the uh, end of the show. But uh, by the way, there's a website called Look Out for the Bull. And if you're looking at managing some money on your own, this is a technique, a technique. It's very difficult. Psychologically, it's difficult. Intellectually, you don't have to be really smart to do it. Actually, people who don't have advanced math degrees probably going to do better with this than people who do have advanced math degrees. Yeah, and there's lots of reasons for that, but I uh, won't be able to talk to, about that much on today's show because I hear the music playing, and uh, that means my show's over. If you've been listening to Bill Bullington, I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. You can go to my website, bullingtoncapital.com, to reach out and connect with us there. Have a good week, everybody. Happy New Year, uh, and hopefully the market will bring us more treats this year. You just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.